Hierbij I opened this academic ceremony in which Sergei Primakov will defend his academic thesis, Artificial Intelligence in Medical Imaging, Cancer Segmentation and Outcome Prediction. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The word is to you. Uh, dear Prorector, uh, dear members of the Corona, uh, dear friends, colleagues, and family members, um, I'm really happy to be here uh, today and defend my PhD thesis. Um, and I also want to say a big thank you all uh, for being here and for your interest in my research. Um, I will now present you a summary of my thesis uh, titled Artificial Intelligence and Medical Imaging, Cancer Segmentation and Outcome Prediction. And I would like to start with the question, what is cancer? And to answer that, uh, let me briefly go through the process of cancer development. So as you might know, human body has levels of organization that sort of uh, built on top of each other, starting with a cell that is the smallest building unit uh, in a living organism. And so these cells uh, make up tissues, and then tissues make up organs. And uh, normally, cells in our body have their purpose, uh, depending on the organ they're in. Um, and they also follow some predefined process. So they grow, they work by performing their function, uh, they divide to make up new cells, and eventually they die. But sometimes the normal cells can become abnormal due to mutation in their DNA, and then such cells can live longer, uh, they can grow and divide faster, and they also do not perform their function anymore. As these abnormal cells keep growing and dividing, they form a mass of abnormal cells uh, that is called tumor, and when the tumor spreads or invade nearby tissues, it's called cancers. So cancer is a complex and versatile disease that can affect uh, numerous vital organs in the human body and can also travel within the human body by using blood vessels and lymphatic system. And uh, while traveling, it can also settle um, in the body parts and uh, form new cancers. And then this process is known as metastasis. So what is medical imaging and how does it uh, relate to cancer? So medical imaging is a technology that allows humans uh, to look inside the body and generate um, images of inner structures. These images help doctors to evaluate functions of organs, see if there are any anomalies, and also quantify them. Uh, medical imaging comes in various forms that are called modalities, and each offering unique insights into the human body. Um, so each modality also has its strengths and limitations. And uh, some modalities uh, like X-ray or, or CT uh, are better, for, for example, for visualizing bones. And others uh, provide more contrast in visualizing uh, soft tissues, like MRI, or can visualize functional changes in the body. Um, so these modalities uh, differ by the way we obtain the image. And modalities like X-ray and CT are based on use of electromagnetic radiation. Um, MRI acquisition, for example, is using magnetic properties of our bodies uh, in order to produce the image. And uh, other modalities like PET or bone scintigraphy scan uh, require uh, an injection of a tiny amount of radioactive substance uh, to visualize the metabolic activity. Um, the choice of modality depends on specific diagnostic needs and also the body part that is being examined. And uh, the research in this thesis involves the use of uh, multiple modalities including magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography, positron emission tomography, and bone scintigraphy images. Um, so what is the role of medical imaging in cancer management? Uh, medical imaging is a crucial tool in almost every phase of cancer management, including uh, screening and diagnosis, cancer staging, treatment planning, response to treatment evaluation, monitoring, and follow-up. Um, so first, to find that person has cancer, medical imaging is used uh, during the screening or diagnostic process to detect tumors and determine their size and location. Once the tumor has been detected, medical imaging is also used in staging of cancer to estimate the extent of the disease um, and evaluate the spread of cancer. Um, the cancer treatment starts with the treatment planning, where medical imaging is used to plan various treatments, including radiation therapy, and it assists uh, doctors in identifying the precise location of tumor and also its uh, proximity to critical structures. Um, medical imaging is also used throughout the course of treatment um, for assessing how well the chosen therapy is working uh, and also can be used to adjust the treatment plans uh, if it's required. 
And uh, lastly, um, once the treatment is finished, medical imaging is used for monitoring and long-term follow-up to check for any signs of recurrence and basically ensure that uh, cancer has not returned. And another very important application of medical imaging is uh, ongoing cancer research that aims to enhance uh, pretty much every step of uh, cancer management workflow. And uh, through quantitative analysis, medical imaging allows researchers to improve understanding of cancer, its behavior, and also help to find better suited therapies and achieve better patient outcomes. Um, moving forward, so what is AI? AI, or artificial intelligence, is sort of an umbrella term uh, for a family of modeling techniques that can perform uh, various tasks that would uh, typically require human intelligence. The unique features um, of these uh, models is their ability to learn how to solve a specific task directly from the data without being explicitly programmed or uh, providing a set of explicit instructions. Um, so AI is used in various industries um, and in just last few years has already revolutionized uh, the world we're living in. And uh, so generally speaking, there are a lot of ways we can use AI to improve uh, cancer management routines. Uh, but in this thesis, I'm focusing on the AI application medical imaging field. So how can AI help? Um, artificial intelligence can be applied to solve a wide range of problems uh, across various domains. Um, and it, it has already showed success in multiple industries outside of medical imaging. And in this thesis, um, I investigate the possibility of using AI in medical imaging field uh, to solve problems like classification, automatic segmentation, and regression, uh, which translates to clinical problems such as cancer detection and classification, automatic segmentation of cancers, and survival prediction. Um, so one of the chapters uh, that I want to summarize in this presentation is the chapter three of this thesis, uh, Prognostic and Predictive Value of Integrated Qualitative and Quantitative Magnetic Resonance Imaging Analysis in Glioblastoma. And uh, glioblastoma is a most malignant primary brain cancer. And in this, in this chapter, we looked at uh, if we can improve uh, the prognostic value and also predict relevant tumor biomarkers for glioblastoma patients using MRI scans. So in this study, we used multiple pretreatment uh, MRI sequences to extract uh, quantitative and crafted radiomics features and uh, qualitative Vasari features. And to deal with the variability in collected MRI data um, and also reduce the effect of this variability um, on the quantitative features, uh, the image preprocessing team was applied before extracting the quantitative features. Then the qualitative imaging features or Vasari features um, they were defined by the doctors, and basically they uh, sort of represent a set of uh, visual tumor characteristics, whereas the quantitative features or handcrafted radiomics features were extracted directly from the tumor region, and these features are gathering the information uh, from the medical image sort of beyond what we can see with the naked eye, and more specifically, they capturing information about intensity, shape, uh, texture of tissues, and also some derived statistics. So this radiomics feature were used individually and also in combination with uh, qualitative and clinical features to build a prognostic model and also to evaluate the effect of integrated analysis. And then separately, the radiomics feature were used with machine learning analysis to evaluate if radiomic feature can capture heterogeneity of tumor structure and correlate it to clinically relevant biomarkers, including IDH mutation, MGMT mutilation, and EGFR amplification. And so finally, all the developed models were externally validated on the data that was coming from a different center. So what we found in this study is that first, um, the integrated model performed better than individual models, and it was also the most robust one. You can see it by looking at the confidence intervals. Second, uh, the integrated model could also accurately split patients into the low and high risk uh, in a significant manner. And um, for predicting the biomarkers, we found that Although the models show some potential to predict them on the test set, on the external validation uh, data, we saw some signal, especially for EGFR amplification and MGMT mutilation, but the performance was not high enough to be clinically relevant. Um, on this slide, uh, we look at chapter six of this thesis, automatic detection and segmentation of non-small cell and cancer computer tomography images. And non-small cell and cancer is the deadliest of all cancers. It affects both genders and accounts for roughly 20% of uh, total cancer death worldwide. 
Um, so in this chapter, we developed a model that could automatically detect and segment non-small cell lung cancer on computer tomography images. So for the purpose of the study, we collected more than 1,300 pretreatment CT scans with, uh, containing non-small cell lung cancer that came from various sources and various hospitals pretty much around the globe. And to deal with the huge variability of uh, imaging parameters that we had in the collected data, we developed an image preprocessing routine that was uh, aiming to harmonize the data. And uh, it was then followed by the lung isolation algorithm that, uh, that was automatically focusing on the ROI, in our case, uh, lung region. And that allowed us to uh, use whole body scan CTs uh, with our pipeline. Um, using preprocessed data, we trained a deep learning model that was able to generate binary masks uh, for the cancer that, would pre uh, that, that was present on CT scans. And uh, deep learning is a subset of AI that involves training artificial neural networks. And um, they are inspired by the function of uh, real life neurons uh, in the human brain. And these artificial neurons uh, form layers, and they can gather deep features from the input. And unlike the handcrafted radiomics feature-based model, deep learning can automatically compute the features uh, from the whole input, so they, they do not require a ROI mask. They can also automatically uh, decide which features are relevant and output the predictions. And predictions, in our case, uh, binary masks, were further used for detection and segmentation purposes. So in this study, we have evaluated multiple endpoints, including quantitative detection and segmentation performance, qualitative performance in the silica clinical trial setting. We also estimated doctor intra and inter observer variability of uh, manual contouring. And then we also used this variability in perspective with uh, quantitative segmentation performance to sort of better understand where, uh, the method, where the performance of our method is. And lastly, we also looked at prognostic power of uh, generated segmentations. So for the quantitative detection performance, we show that our deep learning based approach could detect non small cell lung cancer with high sensitivity and specificity on uh, both test and external validation data sets. For the segmentation point, we have also shown that our model was able to segment non small cell lung cancer with high uh, performance and it was also sort of in range of uh, manual contouring variability. And uh, additionally, we also reported uh, the wide range of quantitative metrics uh, with regards to multiple imaging and tumor characteristics, including uh, slice thickness, tumor size, uh, tumor location, and tumor complexity. Um, additionally, to quantitative and qualitative performance, we have also looked at um, validation of our method uh, from more sort of a clinical angle. And um, we compare the prognostic power of the manual and automatic contours. Um, so we uh, computed the metrics that were based um, uh, on these contours, so metrics such as resist and tumor volume. And um, what we saw that metrics based on automatic segmentations were found to split patients into the risk group in a more significant manner, uh, comparing to those uh, that was uh, based on the manual contours. Um, and lastly, we also did a qualitative assessment where we shown that a group of radiation oncologists and radiologists on average prefer thematic segmentation more often than manual contours um, in a silica clinical trial setting. Um, so very quickly, we'll go through part three of this thesis, uh, open source and patented contributions. And um, here I just uh, personally want to say that um, I was always a big fan of uh, open source code and projects and I also try to publish uh, as much as possible of my research open source. And I think it has been a great experience and also a great tool uh, to connect with uh, researchers uh, from the top universities uh, around the planet. And I'm genuinely very grateful and um, happy with all the feedback that I received. And I'm also uh, very happy if someone wishes to contribute, so please do. Um, and with this, I want to say thank you for your attention and I'm giving the floor back to the proctor. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Decker. He's a professor of clinical data science at Maastricht University, and he was the chair of the assessment committee, and he is present online today. Professor Decker, may I ask you to, uh, to join us? Yes, thank you.
and good morning to everyone there. Let me first of all congratulate you, uh, candidate, on a lovely thesis, right? It's a very hefty body of work. I, I also recognize uh, your open source contributions, which you just mentioned at the end. I think that's a very good thing to do. Um, and let me also congratulate your promotion team there and your friends and family. Um, let me start by asking one of your paranim to read proposition number seven. A dream written down with the data becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps become a plan. Thank you very much. So, um, so the reason I'm, I'm I can't be there, and my apologies for that, is because I'm in Vienna, at the um, International Atomic Energy Agency, and I'm writing. The reason I have to be here is that we write a guideline for medical physicists to introduce AI into the clinic, right? And the type of AI that you have developed um, fits um, those guidelines. Um, so we need to come up, I think AI is a dream, right? And we need to come up with um, a goal and a plan. Uh, so let me first ask you, which of the AIs in your, um, in your thesis you think are the closest ones to be taken up by, for instance, medical physicists to introduce into their clinic, and why? Um, highly esteemed opponent. Um, thank you for the kind words and for your question. So um, I think the closest one is uh, chapter six of this thesis, automatic segmentation of uh, non-small cell and cancer on computer tomography images. Um, because uh, first uh, we did a um, broad study where we developed and uh, extensively validated and evaluated the method. Um, then we also uh, build a POC uh, version of the software that is described in chapter um, eight, I think, the patent. And um, um, so we already have uh, at the moment the software that would allow to uh, basically load the CT scan and automatically segment it. Um, also allow to uh, validate it, and if if the um, let's say the uh, user is not satisfied with the segmentation, quickly adjust it, um, and also allows to calculate um, uh, some metrics from this uh, segmentation, so including the resist and tumor volume. Um, so I would say there is already quite some functionality inbuilt, and. Um, it also has a, a front end, so it's uh, it's not just uh, some research software, uh, but it actually can be used by a real world user um, yeah, in, in a browser. Right. Um, thank you. That's what I thought you would choose, so that makes my life easy. <laughs> um, so, as a, in radiation oncology, obviously we uh, we delineate tumors, right, like that, and we call that GTV. And as you said in your um, propositions, also there's there's certainly not a standard, and it's quite unclear what 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 is a good uh, segmentation. So, one of my worries when we are introducing um, the model that you are stating is in page one eight three of your um, thesis, in which you describe the data flow that you use. So first of all, you use 1,400 uh, patients. Um, and I think you centralize them in, in Maastricht at, uh, at the D-Lab, I assume. Um, and there you interestingly had a, one segmentation expert at your site that reviewed the GTV, if I um, understand this text correctly because these expert segmentations were considered the ground truth for training and further evaluations, right? So what, why would, would I recommend a medical physicist in, I don't know, in rural India to trust a segmentation expert in master? Um, good question indeed. And um, so the, Actually, the ground truth segmentations were um, because we collected data from various sources, also including open sources and some data sets were private. And uh, the segmentations were made in the center uh, where we collected the data by the um, per, per trained professional. I think uh, what we say here is that um, it was also sort of uh, validated by uh, um, uh, trained professional at our site. I was one of my co-authors. Um, 
talking about the segmentations difference and uh, why should someone trust uh, AI? Um, it's it's a good question because um, first we still uh, can help, so we don't want to replace uh, the person who makes the decision, right? We want to help him to speed up the workflow and uh, to provide the tools that can help him in uh, in, in his uh, routine, right? So. Um, our segmentation, um, we uh, again like we validate it on an independent centers, uh, like an external validation, and we show that our performance is quite robust. And um, yeah, if someone in India wants to use our software, um, I think it would actually already benefit uh, this person because uh, first it's uh, it's open source, <laughs> uh, so everyone can uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, use it and uh, download it, and it also does not require uh, any sort of uh, hardware. Um, uh, like I'm talking about GPU, so you can run it on a regular laptop. Um, and um, we we still give um, the person responsibility. So automatic uh, segmentation can be performed by by the software, but then um, doctors uh, is the one who needs to make the decision. So if they're not happy, they can adjust it. Um, and um, until uh, until we're, uh, they're satisfied, basically. Yes, because another proposition you are you're saying that in handcrafted radiomics, the heterogeneity in the imaging data is quite important, right? But I would push. You seem to think that this is only the case for handcrafted radiomics. Is that indeed your position? I I think actually. Um, that there is a lot of variability um, that, and, and pretty much every variability sort of impacting the decision, uh, regardless of if it's radiomics approach or automatic or deep learning approach. And of course, there's a lot of variability coming from scanners and uh, also from segmentations. Um, so um, I, I would agree with you that it indeed impacting the, the outcome. So if, if you would redo this study, right, is, is there something you would change or would you still do it the way you, you did in your thesis? Because I know, you know, the studies take a long time, but would you, would you redo it differently? I think I would um, probably, uh, if, I, if I were to redo it right now, I would probably use um, uh, some updated uh, libraries and uh, let's say uh, more state-of-the-art uh, uh, methods, but um, um, methodically, uh, methodo methodo methodologically, um, I think I would um, um, I, I would still do it uh, the way uh, the way we did it. <laughs> and in terms of data, sorry. And and you would you still use the same data? Uh, no, of course no. Um, so um, there's, I mean, the, the data sets are. Uh, Keep popping up, and I think uh, the last time I checked the CIA, there's uh, more um, open source data sets. So, um, and then of course there's also approaches like uh, federated learning, right, where you can also use uh, or so sort of uh, sign up different centers. Uh, so, um, I would def definitely look into that as well. So, okay, my final question is about the implementation. I understood from your promoter that you're working at a startup now, right? In um, in uh, doing, uh, I think, dentistry, if I understood well. Um, so I think you're very well aware of the regulatory aspects associated with um, uh, using AI uh, for clinical decision support, right? So do you think in an open source facility where you simply upload the data and our people are using your GTV delineation is something we can use in Europe? Or do you think we should try to build more startups or, or join more startups like you've done to, to get them um, as closed source products on the market? Um, I think that um, in Europe, especially um, if you want to bring a, uh, your software to uh, and convert it to a real product from let's say from POC to real product, you really need to be looking for a partner or for a company that is already there on the market uh, who has uh, its clients and uh, um, has that sort of uh, um, software that is used. And I think you would uh, the, 
a good way would be to look how you can integrate your AI, uh, con like AI part into that software. Uh, because, um, I mean, um, there's of course always an open source alternatives and, um, um, but as you said, like with the regulations, um, I think you just have more um, sort of uh, um, possibilities when you're part of uh, of the industry. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. I yield the floor back to the pro -worker. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Traverso. He's an expert in a. I clinical research and oncology, and he is a senior staff scientist at Libera Universita Vita Salute San Raffaello in Milan, in Italy. And he was a member of the assessment committee. Dr. Traverso, he's uh, online today. Thank you, Pro Rector. Candidate. I would like first to congratulate with you and your uh, uh, promotion team for the nice words. There's been a lot of uh, arguments in there, and of course that raised to me many questions because this is my one of my active field of research. So my first question will be a bit around what Professor Decker was saying. So you know, segmentation strongly relies on having a golden standard. Now my point is that it's very difficult to build a golden standard because you know, uh, clinicians have different clinical guidelines. So the way in which uh, people delineate uh, uh, for radiotherapy, for example, planning is very different uh, the, in way when you move through institution. And my argument is even that uh, if you want to do prognostication or prediction, you will always need the contour of a region of interest as you show in your thesis. And there, even if you ask, for example, a radiology to contour a tumor, the radiology will just focus on the gross tumor volume, right? However, if you will ask to a radiation oncologist to contour the tumor, it has been proven that the contour is larger. And this is because the radiation oncology thinks in a sense of a treatment planning. So there are uncertainties in there. So my question for you is, for you is how can you build a stronger golden standard? And if you have, uh, let's say, a lack of uh, experts delineating, can you eventually use AI to support the creation of a golden standard? Um, esteem the point, thank you for your question. So first I would like to agree with you. And um, there is indeed like a lot of um, uh, variation in the ground true segmentations that, that we consider ground true. And uh, there is also sort of uh, what we showed in, um, in in the chapter six as well, where we did the silica clinical trial and we evaluated um, this intra and inter observer variability um, on, on a separate data set. Um, so um, that is, um, yeah, that is also why we actually evaluated our method not only with uh, quantitative metrics, but also we did a qualitative assessment where we basically made a separate uh, tool that uh, allowed, uh, allowed us to show um, uh, professionals from different groups um, scans that were segmented manually and automatically and basically asked there for preference and uh, to get this uh, sort of qualitative score from them. Um, to sort of have more understanding uh, of the you know, of the of the performance of our method, um, and also for the prognostic power, because um, simply when you evaluate it with uh, quantitative metrics and those quantitative metrics, they're based on the ground true segmentations. Um, it's a little bit hard to uh, to say what is good, especially looking at the um, variability of. Uh, uh, the segmentations in the same uh, uh, represented in the same quantitative metrics. Thank you for your answer. I have a follow up question, which is Do you eventually think that we can get rid of contours? So, you know, you have shown in your thesis many, many deep learning algorithms. Of course, if you use radiomics, you are forced to use contours. What if you will use deep learning? Can you eventually get rid of uh, uh, the contours and can you actually input just the wall image? Any drawbacks on that? Can you comment on this approach? I think it's definitely um, 
and a nice and, and a good idea to try. So unfortunately, we did not uh, try it in uh, in the part of our work, but I think indeed it would be interesting to see, especially giving the indication that uh, um, metrics extracted from automatic contours were able to split uh, patients in the better risk group. I think we can try to use this automatic uh, segmentation as well to extract uh, the radiomics features uh, just directly from the automatic segmentations. But uh, I think that uh, indeed. It, sorry, that's indeed an interesting uh, future work uh, project. And do you think eventually what will happen if I just input the whole 3D scan to a deep learning network and then ask the deep learning network to split me patient, for example, the one that will survive, the one that will not survive after treatment? Is that, would you be scared of such an approach? Um, I, I think you, um, I think maybe because um, we sort of, uh, Deep learning is still considered sort of like a black box because uh, it's not that easy to interpret the decision that was made. But there are methods uh, that can help to sort of uh, um, actually make it more inter interpretable for deep learning. It's, uh, for example, the Gradcam method where you can sort of visualize the neurons that fired to uh, lead to the decision that was made. Um, so maybe that can, uh, I think that is a good uh, sort of step in the direction of uh, explaining the decision made by a deep learning model. Thank you for your answers. I will move directly to my third question since you kind of opened the discussion with, with your answer. So, you know, as you mentioned, there's a huge discussion about interpretability and performances, right? So people will argue, well, I would like to have an algorithm that works, is validated, no matter, you know, if this algorithm is fully explainable. On the other side, there are people that prefer to have a less performing algorithms and then uh, try to understand why these algorithms make decisions. So you work on both two sides of the, of the coin, right? You work on segmentations and you work on prognostication uh, or uh, uh, prediction. Where do you think the balance between interpretability and performance stays in the two approaches. Are the same? Is it easier to develop algorithm segmentation compared to prognostication? What, can you quickly describe your opinion about, you know, where should we focus on? Should we focus on performance in segmentation or should we focus more interpretability as well? And what about prognostication? Sure. So I think for a segmentation task, it's actually a, a little bit easier because the output is sort of very visual already. So we can uh, sort of visually assess it uh, uh, right away. Um, when we talk about classification, it's a bit more uh, hidden as, again because it's sort of considered as a black box and we just sort of have this uh, uh, probability on the end. But uh, yeah, again, there uh, we can use uh, methods uh, um, that can sort of uh, uh, visualize um, or like highlight um, uh, how this decision was made and uh, sort of make it a bit more inter interpretable. So I would say for classification, uh, it would definitely make sense to also provide this, um, like make an extra step and also provide some uh, way of interpreting uh, how the decision was made. And for segmentation, I think it's uh, a little bit easier because the output is already very visual. Thank you for your for your. Do I still have time for a quick question, Prorector? Uh, please, uh, one short question, is that possible? Hmm? So I will just ask a, a burning question. So you're talking about uh, um, open source. You know, you publish so much code, and now you have your experience, and you start working in a company. So suppose you are a younger researcher with expertise joining a company, how would you convince your CEO to put the code of the commercial product in an open source uh, repository? Would you convince him to put or to put all the code, just part of the code, is it not needed since there is a patent? Well, it's an interesting question. I think it's uh, going to be a very tough conversation and uh, it's a very challenging task. Uh, but open source has also its uh, benefits, right? So if you're a company of two, 
and you have a very challenging task that you or like solution that you want to build uh, by going open source you can actually get more people involved and uh, maybe that would be an argument one of the arguments that I sort of can think of <laughs> thank you indeed it's not an easy an easy let's say problem to be solved thank you again for your answer I will give the word back to the proactor Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Van Elmt. He is an assistant professor at Maastricht University and is also working as Maastro Clinic in Maastricht and is, he is an expert in medical physics. He was a member of the assessment committee. Dr. Van Elmt. Dear Robert, thank you. Dear Mr. Primakov, um, first of all, congratulations to you and your supervising team for this very nice thesis that I enjoyed reading. Um, I was already acquainted with your work because I had the pleasure as the astrophysics chair to hand you over the Jack Fowler Award in 2021 uh, at the Astro, which is the largest uh, radiotherapy conference uh, in Europe. Um, and also, you don't have these insights, but as a physics chair, I did receive all the rankings of the abstracts, which were more than 1,000, and you were ranked number one with a distance to the number two. So that was actually uh, an achievement which highlights a little bit the novelty and the thoroughness of basically chapter six, uh, which you presented at that conference. So again, congratulations uh, for that. Um, I do have some questions while, while reading your thesis, of course. Um, you discussed a little bit the clinical implementation with the decision support systems uh, for the previous ones. To my knowledge, there are in radiotherapy no radiomics or deep learning based uh, implementations used in clinical routine. Do you know of any? Um. Highly esteemed opponent, um, so uh, thanks a lot for your kind words and um, the question. Um, so I'm aware of a company called Radiomics, um, and I think they actually uh, brought a few of the signature or solutions uh, for various type of cancers. Um, I think that were uh, sort of uh, used, uh, I think at least in uh, clinical trials. Yeah, so, so I'm also uh, responsible for the AI implementation at Mastro, and we did a, 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 an overview of the models. And our doctors were very reluctant um, to implement these models. What do you think their main barriers were when I was discussing this with them? Um, well, um, so I think it really should be um, also maybe explained and provided uh, more as a tool that is um, easy and um, uh, sort of under, like it's easy and understandable so that the people can include it in their workflow because if it's sort of um, yeah, like a, a separate uh, software that you need to spend time on uh, like running and uh, providing data to, then it maybe sort of breaks the workflow and uh, makes it a bit harder. Um, um, yeah, so I would say maybe um, provide more sort of uh, explanations on uh, sort of how to and uh, um, yeah, maybe also gather some feedback on uh, why the doctors are actually reluctant uh, to use it. I can give you one, uh, there, there are a few of them. Uh, so one of it is the AUC, which is typically around 0 0.7, 0 0.75, which is something they, um, well, they think is a problem. What would you respond to them? Um, well, if the AUC is um, um, 0.75 and it's higher than the current, uh, let's say, golden standard, I would still say it's uh, um, of uh, importance. Um, so if it's better than the current uh, golden standard, uh, yeah, well, well, I don't see why uh, they should not use it. Yeah, that's what I responded to them as well. And then the second barrier came up. So, uh, for example, if you have the survival plots, they nicely uh, split, as you showed. Um, but then they tell me what to do with that. So what should I do then next if I see this? Well, so I, I guess it also depends on the, um, the goal. So if we talk about survival and uh, let's say if, uh, if I would talk about a specific example in the glioblastoma case, and there um, I would say survival prediction is uh, very important because I think in one of our data sets, the median survival was just nine months. And then, and that uh, when the like um, very sort of invasive treatment is performed. So um, 
I would say it's important to um, estimate the survival correctly and uh, um, for the uh, to sort of uh, help patient to make the decisions. Mm. Yeah, the main problem they see as a professional is that they don't have really actionable insights that they can do something in their treatment because they're stuck to guidelines or there are no other options. There's only radiotherapy or not treating, which is, of course, always an option. And that, in a way, could help um, using these models to make a sort of well-informed decision. But they, they miss a little bit the real action that they can take from we take treatment A or B uh, from, the, from the current models, which, which hampers them using them uh, in the clinic. Um, the other question I had was on figure three in chapter two, where you have these handcrafted uh, radiomics, where you provide uh, a workflow how to create robust um, radiomics analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, a major component of this workflow is this phantom uh, that you scan and use. And then later on I started reading and then there's a lot of deep learning. So um, is this workflow becoming uh, obsolete? Or what should we do with that? Um, so indeed, um Interesting question. So uh, the workflow we described there is sort of an ideal case. Of course, when you have access to the phantom, when you, you can actually scan the phantom and sort of uh, um, estimate the variance in the um, this reconstruction parameters. Um, right now, indeed, there's also multiple um, deep learning methods that sort of emerging that uh, um, can sort of help with or like um, help reduce noise um, in, in the acquired images. And I think one of them is... Uh, but do you um, think this also works then for the robust uh, evaluation if you have a deep learning based workflow? Can, do, can you use a phantom for that? Except for the noise part that you just mentioned. Um, I think so, yes. I think indeed you can uh, you can use uh, deep learning as well, and uh, that, that might be indeed a, a project on its own. Okay. Yeah, I think that, that how would you design such a phantom then? Um, so, um, well, there's, there's uh, sort of, uh, I think, multiple ways, but the one I can, uh, let's say, if I uh, uh, speculate, I think uh, we can sort of... Uh, measure the existing phantoms and uh, uh, try to sort of uh, generalize them and uh, um, try to make a model that was sort of uh, uh, sample from that uh, generalized sample. Yeah, I think it will be very tricky to design a good phantom that also works on the deep learning uh, part. But we can discuss further. I'm uh, satisfied with your answers. I'll give the word back to the program. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Van Ginneken, he's a professor in functional image analysis at Radboud University in Nijmegen. And uh, Professor Van Ginneken, thank you for traveling to Maastricht to join us here at the university. The word's up to you. Thank you, and uh, dear candidate, congratulations with a, a very impressive uh, thesis that I read with, uh, with great interest. Um, well, Chapter six, I think, is uh, um, very interesting. You show a segmentation method for, for tumors in the lung, which could be used, I presume, for radiotherapy treatment planning, if it would work very well. But from the discussions we had, um, it might be that an, we have already learned that an expert may not agree with the segmentation that your method comes up with, because they don't even agree with each other's segmentations, right? So it doesn't even have to be the error of your segmentation. But in reality, if I also look at the Hausdorff distances, your segmentation sometimes fails, right? Um, and then chapter five in your thesis discusses interactive segmentation, which is a topic I find very interesting. Um, so if your method fails, we could try to do some minimal interaction and then update the, the segmentation. You, you call it in that chapter somewhere remedial human intervention. I found that a, a brilliant uh, phrase. Um, and if I look at, at chapter five, which is a review article, the, there are kind of roughly three approaches that you uh, discuss a bit. The simplest way would be that the expert would just click a few points or maybe make a little stroke. That's a very minimal interaction, which is nice, right? It's not a lot of work. And then the segmentation should update. And you also discuss the option where you 
completely manually segment a 2D contour, and then that, that needs to be used to sort of propagate to the other slices, or even multiple 2D contours. And I would like to discuss these, these scenarios. But the first one is the most interesting one. So I have a, because in chapter six, you basically have a 2D method, right? So let's say for one slice, I'm the expert, I disagree. Now I want to update the segmentation to my liking with, with only one click. So where should I click and how do you then build a new UNET method which fixes the segmentation? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for the kind words and for your question. So um, in, uh, yeah, in chapter six, we sort of went for the fully automated method. So right now you sort of cannot just uh, click and uh, um, uh, yeah, sort of re-update re uh, one of the slices. And although we used a two-dimensional uh, neural network to segment the slices, we used three-dimensional volumetric post-processing. So in the end, we actually processed it in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And um, to, uh, to going back to the um, automatically spotting the scans where, let's say, deep learning can fail or uh, uh, like where, where the segmentation might not be uh, uh, of good quality. Um, that is actually why we also um, reported quantitative performance with regards to multiple factors like slice thickness. Uh, yeah, I, I know that, but I just let's say that I see a slice where I don't agree yeah. and I want to give one click. Should I click in an area that's wrong or should I click on a point where the border should be? And then how do you, can you think of a, a unit that takes that additional information into account and produces a new segmentation which you, uses the hint, the, the click from the user? Sure, uh, so what I can think of is basically some sort of region growing method. So let's say if you're um, in this interactive mode and then you don't like one of the slices and then you erase the segmentation and uh, say, uh, it depends, right, it can be just a, uh, uh, logical operations, right? It can be subtraction or addition and... Yeah, you, you and, and uh, that was also something that I noticed when I was reading chapter five, that as soon as you start to talk about interactive methods, you refer to very old literature. You come with the classical uh, ones, a uh, region growing, a uh, live wire. But of course, we're now, we use the UNET and the UNET worked very well, right? Deep learning is, is the solution you propose in chapter six. Yep. Can you think of a UNET architecture that would guarantee to produce a segmentation where this point that I've clicked on the border is actually on the border of my segmentation? Because then you could use that method. Well, um, then I think you would need to define the border sort of more accurately, not sort of with like one click. Um, because with one click you still sort of need to um, use either a contrast of the image or uh, um, uh, if I'm a human and I'm instructed to draw a contour and just there's a requirement you have to go through that single point that I clicked, I can do that as a human. So a UNET should also be able to do that or a deep learning method. Uh, fair. <laughs> so um, then, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, there, there's probably improvements on, so on, the, um, on the front of uh, region growing methods and then would sort of just use the new updated segmentation that is produced by one of those methods and retrain mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the unit that we have uh, in the current method who is the updated segmentation contour. But if you, if you have to retrain, training is always very, very slow. So you, you would like to have a, an interactive method which doesn't require retraining. Well, there is also a few short learning methods or one short learning methods that can uh, basically uh, perform without retraining, also on uh, like a new domain tasks. So yeah, but that, that such methods, I mean, we can look, for example, at uh, the figure on page 135, where you illustrate a few shot learning. It, it does require um, some slices which have been completely segmented. So that's, that's much more than, than one click. Yeah, so for a few shots indeed, and uh, so the way it works is, uh, I think one 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 shot learning is you have you you have to have at least one image in support set. For zero shot learning, you don't need to have uh, images in support set. Uh, before, indeed, it was trained on let's say a separate uh, data set um, that that is typically quite big. But then these representations are used to basically perform a new task or a new task, a new zero shot uh, segmentation. So, uh, yeah, but, but we're talking, that's also actually something I found surprising. If I look at that figure, 
yeah, it would be great if you could train a long segmentation method with only four examples. That's what you show in that figure. And then you also say zero shot learning refers to methods where the target class is not present. So that would be without a support set. How can that ever work? Then you give it an image and it has to segment something and it hasn't seen a single example. Well, so the thing is it would sort of extract, uh, because it has an encoder, so it would extract these deep features from, the, from your image that you're providing and uh, in the latent space compare them to the features that, it, that are already learned by the model from the different uh, data set for segmenting whatever, if you were segmenting lungs, for example. And then it would sort of try to um, um, yeah, cluster those and um, um, basically perform the segmentation or like output the mask that would satisfy um, those features uh, that were uh, learned during the, uh, on the training set. But I think it wouldn't even know what to segment, right? Well, Maybe you want to segment the vessel. Uh, you haven't told it if you don't have a single example. Um, so for that case, um, yes, but I think you also provide a, uh, uh, you also provide a, yeah, indeed a segmented, um, a, seg a segmented image, um, which is sort of illustrate, uh, yeah, exactly what you, what you want to segment. Yeah. So you need then at least yes, one, uh, one at shot least one. Yes. in this, in this paradigm. But ha have you looked at, at variations of the unit that can take into account a constraint that I, I drew a bit of a border or I clicked a single point? Um, in my research, um, I, I did not look into that sort of uh, networks, um, but um, I'm, I'm sure there is uh, research that is sort of covers uh, that. You, you do reference a few methods, but they're only very uh, superficially described in, in chapter five that maybe could be used. And uh... Well, so the thing with this uh, few shot or like uh, weekly supervised uh, learning methods that they still sort of underperforms comparing to supervised method. So let's say when we have uh, labeled data and we use a supervised uh, unit, uh, the performance would be higher than using yeah, this. Yeah, so that's why you have to, have to use your, your old system trained with a lot of data, but it fails on this slide, so you have to modify it somehow. Mm -hmm. You have um, this minimal feedback. So that's a very challenging paradigm then. It, it, is, it is challenging. Um, so again, uh, the way I would address, uh, I would start from, again, region growing and see if there's any sort of updated uh, techniques that can do it uh, quicker or better and then uh, update this uh, mask and then add it to sort of uh, retrain set because you would not do it for one segmentation, right? If you would have a, a sort of a cumulative collection of these uh, samples that you adjusted and then retrain it on this uh, on the samples. Okay, thank you very much uh, um, for your answer and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Wind. She is a postdoc at the Department of Precision Medicine at Maastricht University. Dr. Wind. Thank you, prorector. Dear candidate, I would like to start, of course, with congratulating you. <coughs> And the rest of your committee mem um, join the committee members in congratulating your supervisors, but also your friends and your family, especially your wife, because I know that finishing a thesis is a group effort. Of course, you did most of the work, and I would like to congratulate you specifically on the well-written thesis. Um, and I was very happy to see that your thesis mentioned the word patient more than 350 times. And being somebody that's interested in patient participation, it kind of triggered me. So my first question is a little bit about patient participation. And I would just like to ask you, how were patients involved in your research? Um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your question and uh, for the kind words. So um, unfortunately, as a researcher, I didn't involve patients that much in my research because I was mostly working with the data that I was already uh, collected. Um, but I think it's indeed a very um, important direction um, on um, to basically include um, patients more into the work. But I think it's also uh, should be done probably uh, by the doctors. Um, and um, as a researcher, I think you can do as much. And uh, maybe again, I would mention the open source because then you also allow uh, perhaps patients to. Uh, use the research output that you did. Um, 
But I think it's mostly should be an effort from uh, the doctors. Okay, but um, just on page 16 in your introduction, you do write that there's different sto uh, studies that explore how to justify and explain deep learning models uh, to both uh, clinicians but also to patients. So if I put that question onto you, how would you explain your models to patients and when would you do that? Um, Interesting question. Um, so I think I would uh, incorporate it in some sort of already inbuilt tool that sort of explains the process or like explains the decision. So it's like uh, patient decision aids. Um, so the way I would explain it um, is again, depending if it's a, um, if it's a decision that was made by the model, um, I would perhaps try to provide also some um, highlights of uh, how this decision was made. Um. But, but so I think we established in previous discussions that you had that your model for um, non-small cell lung cancer is closest to implementation in the clinic. And if it's implemented in the clinic, do you sit next to the doctor when the doctor uses the tool to explain it to patients? Or do you give an instruction to doctors saying, this is how the model works. If patients have questions, you can use this instruction. So my question is more in, in, in practice, how would you explain it to them? In mm -hmm. which stage and when and how? Um, so I'm um, actually... Um, I don't know to which extent it's, uh, let's say the segmentation uh, model should be explained to the patient because uh, the way I see it, I think the doctor should sort of um, take a decision. So the segmentation model can assist. It can uh, sort of uh, generate a segmentation that is starting point and then doctors still need to evaluate it and uh, maybe adjust it or make a decision if it's uh, usable and uh, if the doctor wants to proceed with this segmentation. Um, so in this case, I think doctor would need to explain the decision. Um, we, of course, if the patient is interested, we can explain uh, how the deep learning works and how this uh, segmentation was uh, produced. Um, but I and think maybe more for the, the, because of course your research is also about outcome prediction, which I think is more relevant for patients maybe. So how would you explain those models to patients? And again, would you just go to the clinic and hand out a flyer or would you write something that they can read or would you actually talk to them? So how would you explain it to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, would, um, I think I would go with this um, like a patient decision aid system that's sort of um, uh, like a um, uh, web software that allows patients to explore it sort of uh, in a calm uh, atmosphere. The, all, all the possible decisions uh, that they can make about their or like uh, about their treatment options or um, information about the disease and uh, perhaps uh, can also be added there as information about the software that made the decision and a little bit of exp explaining how it was made and perhaps also um, uh, some specific data that is related to this uh, particular patient uh, with uh, using some of these interpretability methods uh, that are there for deep learning. Okay, thank you. Um, as a bit of an outsider to your field, I've uh, been observing the development of models and to me it seems a bit that you start developing a model and then you have something and then you start thinking about implementation. So my question would be a little bit, if the ultimate goal of developing these models is clinical implementation, um, should you do something different from the start? What kind of advice would you give to people that start a project similar to your uh, projects right now? Should it be more of a multidisciplinary effort where we should involve, I don't know, implementation uh, experts or more companies in the beginning? So what kind of advice would you give starting researchers now if the ultimate goal is implementation in the end? So I think um, they should start from unmet clinical needs and because that's the sort of the goal that we're trying to, uh, to reach, uh, to achieve. So if there is an uh, unmet clinical need for uh, cancer segmentation, then yeah, it makes sense to sort of uh, uh, plan and start the uh, uh, project for developing this uh, tool. And uh, similar to other uh, diseases, if there is a need, then uh, we can start with collecting data or looking for uh, open source uh, uh, data sets to sort of uh, um, yeah, help in uh, proceeding with the uh, project.
Serge Primakov, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The decree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
Says I Primakov, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Lambin is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite you, supervisor, to now take the floor. Professor Lambin. You promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. I promise. By the authority vested in us by law in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Sergei Primakov, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Now give the word to your promoter, Henry Woodruff. Thank you. Thanks, Philippe. Let's make some room here. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, and most importantly, Sergey or Sergey or Sergio, many names uh, in the many years you were with us, but you're the man of the hour now. Uh, today, we gather not just to celebrate the culmination of your PhD trajectory which was quite a long journey, but also to mark the many milestones of somebody who's really exceptional uh, in our lab. Uh, one of the last remaining PhD students and the name that's basically uh, an old guard, uh, synonymous with old guard in our department. So you, you, were one, you were there from the very beginning of our department. Um, actually, uh, the last one is sitting right there of the old guard, of the, uh, the starting PhDs. And I think we're gonna have a ceremony soon. Um, so you were actually the pioneer of deep learning in our department. You were the first PhD who did a deep learning project from, from the very beginning and uh, started using this UNET thing that everybody was talking about. And um, while you were already segmenting uh, GTVs of cancers on CT images, I was still uh, doing the workshop, what was it called, Deep Learning for Poets and I was learning to tell the difference between roses and daffodils, and you are doing cancer. So uh, well done on uh, always being a step ahead of me. And you're actually always a step ahead of me in many things. You bought a house before I did, you got married before I did, you even got a dog before I did. Uh, so uh, in many ways, I was uh, following you uh, uh, and your trajectory. Uh, so you really, when you started, uh, we thought, okay, this thing works. We very quickly got very good results with deep learning. And then you learned a lesson that I think every PhD needs to learn is that it takes a long time from a working product to actually publishing it in a really good journal. In total, three years, I think, from the end of the project to actually getting the paper published. Uh, it was uh, quite a journey, uh, an important lesson to learn, but uh, uh, we were very happy when we finally got it. I think uh, we celebrated quite a bit. Um, but you didn't only go into the depths of research, but uh, also the depths of life uh, in Maastricht with, with your house and your wife, but also so many friends that you made, right? You had uh, Abdallah and Simon and Manon and Eva and Will, uh, all, all these friends that you made here. Uh, you really showed us that uh, this work-life balance thing can really be done quite well with an exceptional thesis, exceptional work, but also uh, a loved uh, member of the lab uh, and somebody who really uh, inspired us to uh, become more like you. Uh, overall, a well-rounded individual, I would say. Um, so today, you know, we are here, uh, a trailblazer in our lab, a dog lover, a homeowner, a Dutchman, uh, as of uh, three weeks. 
<laughs> Again, a step ahead of me there. Uh, and a friend to the lab. So um, to finish up, I just want to uh, uh, quote somebody that I actually don't know who said it, but he said, education is what remains after one has forgotten one has learned in school. And uh, this is something that today, uh, I have to say, you really showed um, how much uh, you've grown uh, in your presentation and your method of answering questions and not being defensive uh, about your work, but really engaging in honest conversation. Uh, that was quite something to see again. So, Dr. Primakov, uh, here's to new beginnings, continued learning, and maybe a new few steps ahead of me in the future. Cheers and congratulations. Thank you. Give the word back. Dear Dr. Primakov, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And I also want to congratulate your wife, your friends and family, and of course the promotion uh, team. Uh, this is the end of the official part. There will be a reception. and. Averso in the background, and after that we go to the staircase to take some more pictures, and then we go to the reception room 